Good morning, church. Today we're continuing our journey through the Advent season, and it's great to have you joining us here for SAC at Home. We'd love to have you take a quick moment to say hi in the chat. Last week we had some lively discussion around our favorite Christmas movies and TV shows. Uh, it would appear that we were unable to come to a consensus as to the greatest one of all time, uh, but we had a lot of fun. I know for myself, I was able to carve out some time this week to watch It's a Wonderful Life for the first time ever. Um, but that chat features there. We would love to be able to interact together during the course of this service. How often do you get to have a conversation while the preacher's preaching? Right? Uh, as we prepare for what is probably one of the most unique Christmas times that we will ever experience in our lifetimes. We want to let you know that we are going to be hosting an online Christmas Eve service at 7 p.m. on December the 24th. While we will miss being together in the building, drinking our hot apple cider and singing together while we hold our lit candles and spill wax all over the place, we are going to try to do that in a virtual sense. Well, maybe don't spill the wax in your own house. Um, we are looking to create uh, a way for us to be able to worship together on Christmas Eve. We're going to have an online service where there will be some Christmas songs, we will light our Advent candle, and you'll get to see some familiar faces. And our hope and prayer is that this will be an encouraging connecting point for you in this season where many of us are going to be missing connecting with others. But this is where you come in. We would love to have you participate with us. We are looking for volunteers that would help us light our Advent count candle and do the Advent reading. All you need to have is a video camera and a candle. That doesn't even need to be anything fancy. What you're going to do is you'll receive a script from us. You will record yourself reading the Advent reading and lighting the candle, and then you'll submit that video. We're going to compile the videos and we're gonna take portions of each and every one of them to make uh, a video montage that will help us light the fifth candle of Advent, which is the Christ candle. If you'd like to participate, send me an email. Uh, I will then forward you the script in the, uh, of the reading and I'll give you some pointers on how to record the video and then you'll send it back to me. We're going to be collecting these videos throughout the upcoming week so the sooner you can get it to me the better. Um, but we're just trusting that this will be a great opportunity for us to worship together virtually this Christmas Eve. And We'll still sing songs. You can still light your candles. Uh, just be careful with the wax, okay? Uh, that is a pain to clean up. Uh, while you're at it, if you are looking for an opportunity to part participate in another upcoming service, on January the 3rd, we're going to have Story Sunday. This is an opportunity for us to share what God's been doing in our lives. We're encouraging you to record a two to three minute video clip of what God's been teaching you. Perhaps there's something that he's impressed upon your heart lately. Um, maybe you joined us for our online alpha or one of our other online studies and God was really working in you and you'd like to share that with your church family so that uh, we can be encouraged as well. Film that, send it in to us. The deadline for those videos is this Wednesday, December the 15th. Uh, we'd love to be able to include you in that service on January 3rd great opportunity for us to celebrate together as we start off 2021. Um, finally, I want to let you know that in the, the new year, we have a brand new online connecting opportunity um, that will begin on Wednesday, January 27th. It's going to be an eight-week series called Discipleship Explored, and it's going to take us on a journey into the book of Philippians uh, and help us to unpack what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Much like Alpha, which we just finished up, we are inviting and encouraging all of you to join us. We will meet together every Wednesday evening. We'll watch a, a short documentary style film before we head into breakout groups for some conversation and discussion together. Now, if you're already part of a city group, I'd strongly encourage you and your entire group to consider joining us. If you've never been a part of an online group, uh, I would encourage you to join us for the first time. And if you were with us 
for the Alpha Online, you know what a great connecting point it was, and we would love to have you back for this time during Discipleship Explored. Head on over to our church website. You'll find information on how you can register. Once you register, we'll send you all of the information, the Zoom link, the PDF of the handbook, so that you'll be able to follow along uh, with us during that season. Uh, and we will look forward to spending a quality eight weeks online journeying through the book of Philippians from January 27th until March 17th. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us and uh, we'll help you out with that. Finally, we want to say thank you for your generous and faithful giving during this season. We'd like to remind you that December 31st is going to be the deadline for all our 2020 giving and let's continue to trust Jesus for his provision, and let's continue to be generous in our response to how God has provided for us. I would just like to invite you to pray with me now. Father God, we are grateful this morning for all that you are doing in our midst. We know that this is a unique season. We know that there are challenges, and yet we know that God, this has not caught you by surprise, that you desire to do a work in our lives. We pray this morning, that through the work of your Holy Spirit, that we would be open to following your leadership, what it is that you'd like us to do, how it is you'd like us to respond. May we be able to reflect on Jesus and what his arrival means for us. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, we looked at Luke chapter 1, and when the angel Gabriel showed up to Mary, one of the words that he used to greet her was rejoice. And I need to be honest, like for me in this season, sometimes it's been difficult to choose to rejoice. It can be easy to be discouraged and overwhelmed, to suffer from anxious thoughts and uncertainty. And yet I'm reminded that in the midst of this Advent season, as we focus on Jesus, these are opportunities for us to rejoice because Jesus showed up to bring hope and life and restoration. He came to bring healing. Uh, everything essentially got turned around because of his arrival. There was a lot of great news that was brought into the world and is available for you and for, I, for, for me. And so I think that it would be fitting for us this morning to sing the song Rejoice, a great reminder that in a season such as this, that we can sit, stand, sing, and be able to come from a place of rejoicing because we know who Jesus is. Come and stand before your maker, full of wonder. Behold his power, glory, yeah, with confidence drawn near. For the one who holds heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends and bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all Children of promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, born with sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of the Father who will never let us go.
walked this path before us, He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise, there's blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry to Him, He hears your voice. He will wipe away your tears. Rejoice in the midst of suffering. He will help you see. Rejoice. Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. family. We are the Wisdans, and we will be leading us through the lighting of our third Advent candle today. In addition to the candle of hope and the candle of love, this morning we light the candle of joy. We are reminded today that Jesus' arrival brings great joy. Please listen to these words from scripture. Luke 2 to 8, Luke 2, 8 to 10. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared upon them, in, and the radiance of the Lord glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to every, I mean, all people. Philippians 4, 4-9 Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Will everyone see that you are considerate in all you do? Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. The arrival of Jesus was to bring great joy to all people. In a world full of brokenness and hopelessness, Jesus prepares us to send a message of hope, peace, love and joy to those around us in this season we have amazing joy available to us in the person of jesus christ this candle reminds us of the joy we find in and through jesus let us pray our father in heaven thank you for the good news that is your son jesus fill us with your spirit and allow us to experience true joy as we follow Jesus. Amen. Church, we trust that each week as we are able to worship together via this online setting that you're able to enter in. And I know it's a challenge for, for many of us, and it's a little different than, than normal, but we can trust that God is in control and that God can use these times. He can reveal truth to us. He can allow us opportunities to respond to him. And we trust that you've been able to worship well uh, from your home in this season. One of the challenges I've found as a pastor is that it's hard to know um, what to do when it comes to recording content and 
uh, when we have times where we make mistakes or something doesn't work out. And we had that happen recently. We had a small team at the church, uh, myself, Brian, Jason, Jeremy, Rob, and Kyle, uh, all socially distanced, following our safety protocols, and we recorded uh, an entire worship set. And then we found out that while the audio worked, the video did not work. And while it was tempting for me to say, well, we'll have to do it all again, or we'll come up with something else, I was really challenged that, no, that perhaps God wants to use that. And I think it'd be a great way for us to be reminded that in you know, seasons such as this, we're aiming for present, being present over being perfect. Uh, we are still trying to do our best and we're growing and uh, I trust that we'll get better at things that we do, but I think that it's a great offering for us this morning to be able to present, you know, uh, what our team got together, a worship moment, so to speak. So you're going to see the lyrics on the screen. Uh, it'll be a static background. you see a Christmas thing. Uh, but you know the voices for many of you. You've seen them play before. And my hope is that this will be a great opportunity for us to worship together, even though you may not actually see the band. Join us in singing this song. Before the 
Well, good morning. Well, we as a church have been journeying through a series called The Characters of Christmas. Last week, we heard from Pastor Mike, and we looked at one of the most well-known characters from the Nativity, Mary. Before we take a look at the next person in the series, I want to begin by reading with you from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's alive and active, and that you speak to us through your word. Even now, you can speak to us. So we pray that as we look closer at another character from the Nativity, that you would open our minds, open our hearts to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, question for you. Before we dive into this very familiar text from Matthew, out of all the characters we read about in the Nativity, other than Jesus, of course, who stands out the most to you? So last week it was Mary, could be the shepherds, the three wise men, the angels. It's interesting that when we refer to the Christmas story, many of us don't immediately think of Joseph, do we? I was reminded recently that in the typical nativity play, Joseph doesn't even get any lines, does he? A well-known writer and preacher, A.W. Tozer, puts it this way. The reserved, unobtrusive Joseph tends to hover in the background in our retellings of Christ's birth. But yet he's here in the pages of Scripture. And if Matthew felt him important enough to mention, maybe we need to take a deeper look at this character and the importance of his place in the Christmas story. So who is Joseph? Well, we're told Joseph was a tradesman. How do we know? Well, when we jump ahead to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he's teaching in the synagogues in his hometown, people are amazed and perplexed by his teaching. And they ask, from Matthew 13, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Now the Greek word for his trade, used in the Gospels, was commonly used for artisans, craftsmen, and woodworkers, but could also be used of stonemasons, builders, and construction workers. So though his specific occupation is not confirmed, we know he was a tradesman and would probably not have been high on the social ladder. Like most tradesmen in his day, his goal would have been, as author David Jeremiah puts it, to pursue his craft, maintain a good name in the community, attend synagogue, and raise a family. Pretty simple, but noble aspirations. As we know from the Christmas story, those simple aspirations would soon be significantly challenged. Secondly, he was a descendant of King David. 
part of the line through it was, which it was prophesied the Messiah would come. And this genealogy is recorded as well in the Gospel of Luke. Now we know through Jewish historians that for the Jewish people, lines of descendancy were extremely important. And very detailed records were kept to ensure accuracy. So Joseph's genealogy being recorded, mentioned in scripture, and referred to, is no accident or afterthought. Thirdly, we're told he was faithful to the law. So in those days, the law referred mainly to the five books of the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament. But we also see through this passage that he was compassionate. His adherence to the law was tempered by a sense of mercy and grace. Now, it's important to remember that when Joseph discovers that Mary is pregnant, they are betrothed. So Pastor Mike went into this last week because this is really important. A betrothal was a legally binding agreement. It was really as good as a marriage. Though the couple would have very little contact before the official marriage in the betrothal stage, it was still very, very important. All the expectations of a marriage were in place. In fact, this is interesting, if a groom passed away during the betrothal stage, the woman was considered a widow. So because of the significance of this contract, Mary's supposed unfaithfulness left her vulnerable to public disgrace and even to possible death. So Joseph faced a difficult choice. Not only was he probably feeling extremely betrayed, but according to religious law, he couldn't marry an unfaithful wife. Yet to press charges publicly and expose her to public shaming put her at risk. So as a compassionate man, he decided to quietly end the engagement and keep the news secret. It's pretty clear that no matter how difficult this revelation was, Joseph's first instinct was to protect Mary. So that's Joseph. Simple, hardworking, devout, a man of both compassion and principles. But what makes him significant? Why did Matthew choose to include him in the Christmas story? And why are we still talking about him all these years later? Simply put, he was faithful. Preacher John Piper describes him, in fact, as an exemplar of faith, a common man who dared to be obedient to God's will for his life. Now to understand the depths of Joseph's faith, I think we have to look a little deeper at the significance of what he was actually facing. Let's just consider that prospect for a moment. First of all, as part of a shame and honor society, Joseph could face rejection from the community. Their society would, see, would assume either that Mary had been unfaithful to Joseph or they had both been unfaithful to God. For someone who had been brought up to revere God and center his life around the law, consider these instructions given to the people of Israel from Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 to 9. Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 to 9. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the doorframe of your houses and on your gates. So for an honorable man like Joseph, even the appearance of flouting this law would have been heartbreaking, really. Not to mention the prospect of being rejected by his community. Secondly, he was giving up his rights to self-determination. Clearly, 
he is not in control of this storyline. Tim Keller makes an interesting observation. He notes that in biblical times, a Jewish father usually named his son, his child, showing that he was, in fact, master of his home. But listen to what the angel says to him in our passage today. The angel says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. You are to give him the name Jesus. Joseph is not the one who chooses his name. And that's significant. Just as this son will not be Joseph's blood relative, Joseph won't even get to take part in a Jewish father's rite of passage, determining the name of his son. But thirdly, and most importantly, by legally taking on this child as his own, Joseph is stepping into very big shoes, isn't he? He is being asked to father the long-awaited Savior of the world. And this is something I think we often take for granted. I mean, we sing about it in Christmas, Christmas carols every year. But let's just consider what that actually meant. See, throughout the Old Testament, prophets foretold the coming of a great Messiah who would rescue God's people from their sins and establish a kingdom that would last forever. In fact, there are more than 300 specific prophecies in the Hebrew Scriptures about the promised Messiah. I think theologian John MacArthur sums this up beautifully. He says this, The central personality of Old Testament prophecy is the coming of a great king who will rule in God's promised kingdom. Over and over, we are told of a special individual who has the righteousness, the wisdom, the power, the authority, and the right to reign not only over Israel, but of the entire earth. This coming great king will have the power to bruise Satan's head, take back man's dominion that was lost through sin, and establish at last a kingdom on earth that will extend into eternity. Wow. That's a big weight for a father to carry, isn't it? Here are just a few of the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. From Genesis 3.15, God speaking to the serpent in the Garden of Eden about his downfall. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Isaiah 7.14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 9, familiar Christmas verse. For to us a child is born, to us a child is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. From Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem, though you were small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And Isaiah 49, 6. I will make you a light to the Gentiles, and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. But by the time of Jesus' birth, the people of Israel have been waiting for over 400 years with no word from God through his prophets. There has been silence from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament. There is still no sign of their Messiah. But now he has come. Joseph is being asked to step into the pages of God's redemption story by caring for the author of that story, the one who would conquer sin and death through the cross and establish his kingdom forever. The most history-altering, says Tim Keller, life-transforming, paradigm-shattering event of history, and Joseph is being asked to be a part of it. Now, for those of us who have been first-time parents, can we just think about that 
for a second. We all know what a responsibility parenting is. The feedings, the diaper changes, the sleepless nights, the worrying about health and, and maybe education in the future. Some of us are more organized than others. Now add to the weight of that an eternal kingdom. How do you wrap your head around that? Yet considering all that, the risk of being ostracized within his community, the loss of self-determination as he follows God's plan rather than his own, the weight of his responsibility as the father of the promised Messiah, Joseph chooses faith despite all that. Why? Well, I think when we look back at the text, the answers to this question are in some ways obvious and in some ways not so obvious. And this is the heart of what I want to talk about today. Why does Joseph choose faith? And what can we learn from his faith? Well, let's start with the obvious. First of all, Joseph has a dream. Not just any dream, but a dream that is actually a supernatural encounter. An angel of the Lord appears to him and, and says to him, don't be afraid. What is conceived is from the Holy Spirit. And this child will save his people from their sins. Now it's interesting, when we look back at history, the Jews' distinctive view of God made them the people on earth least open to the idea that a human being could be God. I mean, the Jewish people couldn't even pronounce or spell the name of God due to his holiness. We know that in the Old Testament, when God encounters his people, often it's terrifying, isn't it? During one of Moses' encounters with God, this is one of my favorite stories, God, as he passes by, actually puts him in the cleft of a rock and covers him with his hand to shield his face. And he says, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. That's from Exodus 33. So this news that God has now come in the flesh is so wild, so paradigm shifting, that it necessitates God intervening. And he does so in a dream. We know that dreams were seen as a very plausible means of divine communication at the time. And we see that it certainly gets Joseph's attention, doesn't it? But what can we learn? from Joseph's response to that dream. Well, Joseph's response to this dream shows us that faith is not just something that's defined or read about in a book. It's something we actively demonstrate, a concept we live out. Joseph has a divinely inspired encounter, and he steps out in faith. And that doesn't mean the decision would have been easy Sometimes I think we underestimate the pressure he would have been feeling. But faith is in the moving forward, despite how we feel. What we see as we continue in the book of Matthew is that Joseph's first dream was only the beginning. He needed to continually take small steps in faith and rely on God's provision. How many of us have been there? God calls us to step out in faith in different ways. He speaks to us personally, maybe, reveals truths from his word, speaks to us through other people who are praying for us, opens doors. It's amazing. But then we have to step out. That's the hard part, isn't it? It's the same with Joseph. God speaks, but then Joseph has to respond. So Joseph has a dream but he also has a relationship. Joseph's faith is not determined by external circumstances, but it's rooted in the one who is in control of those circumstances. How do we know that? Well, first of all, we're told he's faithful to the law, but also he's sensitive to God's voice. As we continue on in Matthew, we're given this sort of bird's eye view of Joseph's continuing communication with God. We know that when Jesus is still quite young, Joseph has another divinely orchestrated dream, 
and he's told to escape with his family to Egypt. And then when the threat is gone, the threat of Herod, he's directed to go back, back home. And then he's directed to settle in Nazareth. So not only is God communicating with Joseph, but Joseph is listening and responding every step of the way. And even more importantly, we see that God proves reliable and trustworthy. I wonder if Joseph's faith grew. With every step in faith that he took, I wonder if it grew. As he experienced God's provision in powerful ways and saw centuries of of prophecies fulfilled in the life of their family, how could it not? Speaker and author Priscilla Shire uses the example of a chair to illustrate this idea of relying on the object of our faith rather than faith itself. She points out that every time you or I sit in a chair, we trust in its ability to carry our weight, don't we? And the more times we sit and it proves its structural soundness, the more we trust it. In the same way, our faith is not reliant on our own strength, our own abilities, but on the one who carries us. She says this, A little faith is all you need when it's firmly planted in the right person. Good faith isn't a certain size or strength. It's simply faith that's directed at and rooted in a good God. So what can we learn from Joseph's relationship with God? Well, we can have that relationship too. For us on the other side of the cross, as people justified through Jesus' death and resurrection, we now have the Holy Spirit and through him continuous access to God the Father. That's straight from Ephesians 2.18. If we jump ahead to the New Testament, to John 14, we see that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to his followers. He said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. He lives with you and will be in you. So that same access Joseph had to God's guidance, we have it too, but in an even more profound way. We just have to nurture it. So I remember when I was a child, we went through a stage where my family decided to get rid of cable which seemed like a good idea at the time, until we realized we had no access to sports, which I'm sure you can imagine didn't go down too well, especially with the males in our family. So one day, someone in our family figured out that if you took one of the wires coming out of the TV set and you attached it to metal jewelry, gold worked best, you could get just enough of a signal to still get the hockey. So this only lasted so long. There was so much fiddling, manipulating wires, connecting them to pieces of jewelry. And then we decided we might as well just order cable. See, in the same way, Jesus' followers have the Holy Spirit. But as a well-known preacher once said, sometimes we're operating on a lower frequency. When we spend time communicating with him, listening to him, we dial up that frequency. Joseph's communication with God is dialed up, so to speak. Why? Because it's consistent, and that relationship strengthens his faith. How much stronger should that connection be for us who have the Holy Spirit? So Joseph has a dream, and he has a relationship. But his faith is also rooted in a story, God's story. His faith is rooted in the knowledge that he is part of a much bigger story than his own. Looking back, back at Matthew 1, 22 to 23, it says this, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. 
The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's the heart of this story. The God who, as Tim Keller puts it, is infinitely holy, so our sin could not be shrugged off, and infinitely loving, had to come himself and do what we couldn't do. God's justice and his grace intersect in the person of Jesus, and they intersect at the cross, and Joseph is invited to be a part of this beautiful redemption story. But here's what I struggle with sometimes, if I'm being honest. In hindsight, we know that Jesus goes on to fulfill his mandate on earth. He heals the sick, raises people from the dead even, preaches about the the coming of God's kingdom, and even shares with us a foretaste of a renewed heaven and earth. He teaches about the forgiveness of sins, and ultimately in an act of extravagant grace, he dies on the cross to pay for ours. He rises from the dead on the third day, overcoming the power of sin and death, and gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit as our comforter, our helper, as the manifestation of his power on earth. But Joseph doesn't get to see it. He doesn't get to see the rest of the story. We know from the Gospel of Luke that our last record of Joseph is when Jesus is 12 years old and Joseph takes his family to Jerusalem for the Passover. The man who embraced Jesus legally as his son, despite not being his flesh and blood, who would have given his son his first lessons on the law of God, who lived his life by faith while not fully understanding, doesn't get to see the fulfillment of God's promises. That's tough, isn't it? But isn't that the space we live in right now? I mean, here we are waiting for a vaccine to end this pandemic, waiting for the wave to end, for a return to normalcy. Maybe some of us are waiting for our financial situation to turn around, for our health situation to be resolved. Maybe some of us have lost loved ones this past year, and we're in that space where we know we'll see them again, but not yet. Maybe some of us are even feeling a little disappointed in God. Have you been there? On a larger scale, all of us are waiting still for the return of Jesus, for the new heaven and earth he'll bring. Romans 8.22 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Isn't that the truth? We are all living in the in-between, in the not yet. You know, in the New Testament book of, of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, starting at verse 1, the author looks back at a long list of people who encountered God in powerful ways, kind of the who's who in the Bible stories we grew up with. And the author says this about them. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And he continues with a long list of examples of God followers who walked by faith. But then he says this in verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Wow. How do we live in the present, look forward to the fulfillment of God's promises, when the word is sometimes not yet? For those moments when it's hard to see beyond our own messy, complicated stories, when we can't see his redemption story at work, how do we move forward? How do we, like Joseph, walk in faith? How do we trust that there's a larger story at work beyond even our own stories? Well, this is a complex question, but I believe scripture does have a 
a few things to say about it. I want to take just a moment to look at a few things Scripture has to say about how to walk in faith before I close. First of all, we're told to read his promises in his word. Can I just be honest here? Sometimes I feel like this is something we're told so often in church that it can start to sound kind of cliche. It kind of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? But I, I want you to hear something this morning. Any time that we point you to Scripture and any time we point ourselves to Scripture, we really mean it. This is not just a book of history, of, of law, poetry, genealogies. It is, of course, but it's inspired by God. We're told it's God-breathed. I love that line. That's from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's alive and active, Hebrews 4. And I can't tell you how many times God reaffirmed his promises to me and to those I know through his word. So there was a point in time when, when my family and I were going through a period of transition, and I struggled with fear. You know, I think sometimes, maybe you can relate, there are times when we fear reading God wrong. At least I've gone through that. We fear ending up on the wrong path. Like if we make a mistake, God will somehow abandon us. As if he's looking at us and saying, that path? Really? <laughs> on your own there. I think if we're to be honest, sometimes that's how we feel, isn't it? But during that part of my faith journey, reading promises from God's word kept me grounded. There are times when all I could do, and everything I could do, really, was sit and read his promises aloud. One of his promises that became very personal to me was from Psalm 139, 7 to 10. And it's this. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence. If I go up to the mountains, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. This verse became so important to me that I now actually wear it around my neck. And God continues to be faithful with that promise. What's your favorite promise from God's word? Share it if you're able in the chat. Secondly, we're told to remember and record his fulfilled promises. The Bible often talks about the importance of remembering God's faithfulness. Psalm 77, 11 to 14 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. In the Old Testament, God's people instituted important traditions to remember God's faithfulness to them. The Israelites remembered God rescuing them from Egypt by marking the Passover. Throughout the Old Testament, God's people used memorial stones to mark moments and places where God moved in powerful ways. The list of times when God's people remembered and marked his faithfulness, there are many. The point is, remembering strengthened their faith. You can't have relationship without trust. For myself, when I've taken the time to read about God's fulfilled promises in Scripture, and also to record those moments when God has been faithful to me in personal ways, I've been encouraged and my faith has been strengthened. That's why we have Story Sunday, right? So how has God been faithful to you? What's your story? And finally, know the one who is faithful. Let's not miss that. Know the one who is faithful. Joseph knew the God he followed. 
Philippians 3.10 says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. How many of us, myself included, can say, I want to know him beyond even what he can give us. I want to know him. SAC women have been spending a lot of time in prayer over the past year through the women's Bible studies and through the Alpha program. But what we're discovering is something very simple. The more time we spend with God, the stronger our relationship with him becomes. Mother Teresa had such a simple way of putting things. She once said this, God speaks in the silence of the heart and we listen. And then we speak to God from the fullness of our heart and God listens. And this listening and this speaking is what prayer is meant to be. I wonder if sometimes we overcomplicate the process of prayer. I mean, the creator of the universe, he promises that when we listen, he'll speak. And when we speak, he'll listen. It's really that simple. How serious are we about knowing God? I mean, knowing him personally. He can give us that thirst for him if we ask. So what comes to mind when we think of Joseph? One word, faith. An act of faith fueled by a supernatural encounter, but also a faith defined by both a relationship with God and by Joseph's trust in a greater story beyond his own. As we close, I want to take a moment to pray with you. I want to pray for our faith. That whatever you're walking through right now, God, first of all, would give you a hunger to know him better. And the spiritual eyes to trust in his greater story at work. But also, if you haven't begun that faith journey we see demonstrated in the life of Joseph, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Every faith journey has a beginning. So I want to invite you to pray with me. If you so feel inclined this morning, I want to invite you to, wherever you are, stand, raise your hands, kneel, however you feel led. There's something very powerful about that physical expression of openness to God that posture of submission. We're behind screens too, so probably nobody sees you. Nobody sees you but God. So however you want to position yourself, however you want to open yourself to God, let's pray. God, thank you for the example of faith we see in Joseph. Thank you that we can trust that no matter what we're going through, you are with us. And God, your greater story is always at work. I pray for us this morning. I pray for our faith. I pray that whatever we're walking through, you would remind us that you are still with us. You are still ready to speak to us and that your greater story is still at work and that you're inviting us to be a part of that greater story. Holy Spirit, would you fill us afresh? Would you renew in us a sense of faith, of trust in you? Help us to seek you first beyond what you can give us. We are open to how you want to lead us. We are yours. And for those of us who don't know you, God, would you help them to pray 
this prayer with me right now. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I'm sorry for trying to live my life on my own, apart from you. Would you come into my life? Would you be Lord over my life? And would you show me how to walk with you, how to live this life of faith with you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts on for like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Give her of Church, thanks for joining us this morning. So great to have you here. Um, hopefully you've been able to connect with each other and hopefully that God has made himself known to you. We trust that this will be a season where you will be able to focus on what it means for Jesus to arrive. Uh, if you want to stick around for a few minutes after the service, we will be in the chat. Uh, we would love to have some conversation together. If you'd like one of the pastors to pray with you or for you, click on that little link on the screen that says request prayer, and one of us will pray one-on-one -on -one with you. If there's something that we can be praying for you as an entire church, 
uh, please let us know at the church office. Send us an email so we can get that out to uh, all those uh, prayer warriors that are in our midst. If there's anything we can be doing to support you, to assist you, to come alongside you in this season, if you just need somebody to talk to, please, please reach out. Let us know. We love you. We're praying for you. And we will see you same time, same place next Sunday.